Hi everyone. Can everyone hear me? Welcome to our final um, Flourish Artists Talk. Um, tonight we've got Claire Wilberg and Suzanne Bethel and Lucy May Schofield talking about their work. Um, thanks for joining us, everyone. If I could ask everyone who's joined us to mute yourselves and turn off your cameras, and then there won't be any stray noises or images flying around our screens. And the best way to view the, the session is through the presenter view, apparently, rather than the grid view. Um, each artist will give a presentation for about 10 to 15 minutes, one after the other, and then we will take some questions at the end. And you can chat, you can, you can comment and ask your questions but via the chat button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and at the end of the presentations, I will start scrolling through all the comments and questions and I will, I will share them with the artists. We're due to finish at about 8.30, so we've got an hour to listen to each artist talk about their work. Um, I'm delighted that Flourish has been able to become a physical exhibition in a real space in Huddersfield Town Centre. And uh, next Saturday, the 12th of September, is the final day of the show there. So that's your last chance um, to see the show before it moves to Scarborough at the Wood End Gallery. Um, it will be in Scarborough from the 3rd of October until the beginning of January. Now, we're still learning how to do all this on, online stuff. We've had a few technical hitches along the way. Hopefully, we won't have any tonight. Um, each artist will be talking and sharing videos. Um, and like I say, we, we can ask them questions at the end. Um, I think that's about it in terms of housekeeping. So, uh, oh, I always forget this. I'll introduce myself first, Martin Lucas. I'm the exhibitions coordinator at West Yorkshire Print Workshop. Um, and all our talks are being recorded and you can access them online through IGTV and I believe YouTube as well. So welcome and welcome to Suzanne, Claire and Lucy. I'm going to hand over first to Suzanne Bethel to give us a, an insight into her practice. Suzanne is based in Greater Manchester in Stockport and you'll probably recognise Suzanne's work from the poster for Flourish. So over to, Suz to Suzanne. Um, Hello, everybody. Hello. We can hear you. Okay, great. Um, so... Is that okay? Can you? That's great. Hello, I'm Suzanne Bethel. I'm a painter and printmaker uh, who enjoys combining these processes. I also construct assemblages from elements of my previous artwork. My art tends to be intuitive and experimental, diverse in scale and media. I'm currently in my studio, which is in Compstel in Greater Manchester, and I'm going to tell you about my inspiration for my artwork, my practice over time, and a little about the work I've submitted for Flourish. In the last six years, I've experimented with block relief printing and collar graphs, mono printing created through layering ink onto perspex, and mixed media screen print mono monotypes, taking a complete printmaker course and many short courses, including with the printmaker Catherine Jones and painters such as Gareth Edwards from the St Ives School to top up skills. Most of my prints are monotypes or monoprints in series because I enjoy experimenting. 
and I want to create something new each time. What I love about printmaking is the indirectness, the excitement of the reveal as the print is peeled from the plate or the screen lifted from the bed. Largely self-taught until taking a sabbatical from my lecturing role in 2000 to complete a foundation in art and design, my work has been experimental and diverse, changing significantly over time. Prior to 2000, I was largely creating A1 size still lifes, forest fruits and flower seams. Early printmaking included collagraphs and small scale etchings. I've been exhibiting since the 1990s. My first solo exhibition was at the Pankhurst Centre in Manchester and I was subsequently involved in several exhibitions at Warrington Art Gallery. In 2018, I exhibited in the open at the Royal Scottish Academy Edinburgh and was a finalist at the inaugural home exhibition in Manchester earlier this year. I'm represented by the Portminster Gallery St Ives and Kin Art Gallery Manchester. There have been multifarious global, contemporary and historical influences over time, including writers and poets. Artists whose influence persist generally have a strong colour focus and many paint and print with the processes becoming integral. For instance, Patrick Heron, Bruce McLean, Barbara Ray. I love her painterly techniques with screen print, drawing into the work and onto the screen and the sheer joy of colour in Albert Irving's work. I was blown away when I saw the work of Sally Gabori, an Aboriginal painter, in Sydney in 2017. The scale, energy and sheer exorbitant colour which instantly delights. The Vivian Souter exhibition at Tate Liverpool, just before lockdown, was an inspiration. I often choose to use shapes similar to those she uses. Since 2000, my work has been mainly abstract or semi-abstract. Experimental in terms of scale and media, I often work intuitively. However, there remain some constants. Colour, its potential to excite the eye, engage the heart and awaken the soul is central. The colours I use both consciously and unconsciously, are indicators of the influence of life experiences. Inspiration arrives from a sense of place, a sense of time, or a desire to invoke a particular emotional response. Following a trip to Kenya in 2014, a series in oil entitled Circles Unbound included rich earth reds, deep burning oranges, intense cadmium yellows and muddy ochres, reflecting the colours of the Savo Plains, the vibrancy of African textiles and a sense of freedom. These pieces formed half a solo exhibition in High Peak, coupled with a variety of block relief and collagraph prints. The ways in which painting feeds into print and vice versa can be seen here in Circles Unbound, especially number four, which led into creating fruit bowls collagraphs. Also, there are glimpses of the earliest elements of the urban series in the eclipse block reliefs here. The focus on the square and square images can be seen in paintings here too, which have the feel of prints. Later, I was to create a series in print, Serenity of Square Pink 1, 2 and 3, and these were created by layering inks onto perspex. I'm interested in the power of colour to alter mood and mind state. The work of Joseph Albers, exploring the ways in which colours interact with each other, and research which proposes that there exists a universal visual language of mark and line, which can induce particular emotional responses. Prussian Blue series, inspired by a sense of time, created as autumn faded into winter, maximised upon the capacity of blues to be calming and meditative, reinforced in some by a fluid, gentle horizontal, 
align according to Betty Edwards and her small-scale qualitative research, which can be read as tranquil. This is a particular interest, the idea of a universal language of mark making, which artists employ often unconsciously, together with specific colours to evoke particular emotive responses. Hopefully a meditative quality is achieved through the use of deep and shallow undefined bands of colour, creating soft repeating irregular horizontals. This work evolved from a summer series which reds, yellows and hot whites predominate, colours reminiscent of searing heat, sand and sunsets. The urban series grew out of fizz, jazz and Indian memory monoprints. I began to use neons for the first time. In fact, city jazz perhaps illustrates this emerging relationship most clearly. The early urban pieces were static and incorporated geometric shapes, squares, circles and rectangles overlaid by meshes, nets, columns and pillars. I love Manchester and the work has been loosely inspired by architecturally exciting regeneration areas of Manchester, such as New Islington and Ancoats, the nightlife and street art of the Northern Quarter, which is where some pieces were originally shown. I hope the neons would capture a sense of the vibrancy of club life, spheres of reflected lights glinting in Manchester's glowing nights and rain. the spiralling marks and nod to street art, the collage material with its metallic on some reference urban glass and steel, facades and grills. Each piece is unique, although particular shapes and motifs reappear in varied positions and combinations. Each has been created by a layering of shapes, images and colours using frisk and photo emulsion stencils created from hand painted and found material together with the collage elements which have become integral through overprinting. It's an intuitive constructive process as the image emerges from the pull. There's a pause, a waiting to get a feel for what next, fired by the excitement of discovery as each new layer transforms the previous. As you notice, work usually takes the form of a series which has its own momentum and can be made over a month as with jazz and fizz or over a much longer period as with the urban series until it reaches its own conclusion. The urban series grew out of jazz and fizz which in turn evolved the Victoria Bath series developed in April for a physical exhibition which was swiftly reimagined and adapted for online viewing in response to the pandemic. Originally responding to the colours and surfaces of this iconic building in Manchester, initially creating tiles that directly reflected this, the work began to morph into assemblages, informed by the materials of construction and restoration. It began to incorporate elements of meshes and columns, evident in the urban series, but extending beyond maximising on the potential assemblages offered to experiment with diverse materials. And so one series comes to harbour the seeds of the next creative direction, although conscious awareness of this may only arise when the new project is flourishing, and reflection provides insight, sometimes in a gestalt moment. And so what next? During lockdown, I've been busy painting. As lockdown began to ease in May, inspired by the work of Sally Gabori, I began to paint, referencing journeying. And so we begin to move, move freely. 120 centimetres by 68 is one of another ongoing series. Additional lockdown work can be seen on my website. Now able to revisit Hotbed Press, of which I'm a member, the mark making of the journeying work is influencing my screen printing as I experiment with drawing on the screen with crayon. 
The Urban Series is currently exhibited in a solo show called Mesh at the Pilcrow Pub in Manchester. Many thanks for listening and many thanks again to West Yorkshire Print for this fantastic opportunity. That's great, Suzanne. Thank you very much. Is there anything you want to add at the end? I think you've said it all, haven't you, in your, in your presentation, your video? Yeah, I think I've said it all. Excellent, excellent. I love that idea of, um, oh, what was it, exciting the eye and engaging the heart. Oh, Lovely. Thanks. Um, as I said at the beginning, we'll, we'll ask Suzanne questions at the end of the three presentations. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to hand over next to... Claire Wilberg, who all the way in London. One of the things I love about these these artist talks is that people some from so many different places around the country have been able to join at the same time. Fantastic. Um, so, Claire, let's unmute you. Yeah, <laughs> I'm unmuted. Get, there, there you are. Excellent. Um, yeah, I mean, over to you. Tell us, uh, tell us where you are, what you're up to, where you're from, and and let's. I think you've got a video for us as well. Haven't I, you? I have. Yeah. Okay. Are we ready to go then? Ready to go. Okay. Fine. Um, yeah, I'm going to show a uh, a video about my work, uh, me in the studio. So it's probably the best thing to start off with, and then I will continue and elaborate. Okay. I'm Claire Wilbeck and I'm a printmaker based at Slaughterhouse Print Studio, which is in Stockwell in South London. For the last few years, I've been documenting these plastic objects that I find whilst walking, um, and they've become a really important archive and source of inspiration for my work. I'm fascinated by the variety of things that I find, uh, whether they're something related to manufacturing or just some kind of part of a toy. They all seem to have had some kind of former existence. I collect and repurpose quite a lot of old packaging and I really like to use the found marks on the, on the packaging to determine the shapes that I end up creating. A lot of my decision making actually happens during the making process where I'm continuously adding and editing both to the colours that I'm using and also to the shapes that I'm printing with. I see my prints as archives for my objects. I like to see them as, as layers of shelving, holding, storing and bringing the different combinations of all the objects that I have together, a bit like a kind of museum collection. A lot of my decision making often happens on press. It kind of gives me the freedom to be more spontaneous. Um, all my prints are one off um, and I'm often working on multiple prints at the same time. It allows me uh, space to edit and change uh, some of the different elements, which uh, is useful if you're working in that way. My background is in sculpture uh, and therefore I, I kind of would say I'm drawn to shape and structure in um, in a different way um, and surprisingly I don't really see myself as a colour person perhaps this in itself has given me more uh, some kind of freedom in my approach to it. The objects in my prints combine and merge to construct overlap and create different kinds of spaces that have a, well, I've tried to make them have a distant reference to the real world um, and I like to explore ideas about the forgotten and overlooked, giving them some kind of renewed existence in the work that I produce. The prints I have at the Flourish Award are part of a series of work I've been making over the last six months. I also make stop motion animations, and this was a large focus of my lockdown period when I was unable to get to the studio. The animations use the leftover printing shapes and I like to create short narratives that try to extend their existence and push them into a new life. The animations, unlike the prints, were fairly quick to make and I liked using natural light and shadows to document the passing of time.
Okay. Am I back on screen? You're back on, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Um, so that's my uh, kind of presentation. Mainly that is a, based around the work that I've done for, uh, for the exhibition. But I'm just going to talk a little bit about, um, about how I work and what I do and all that kind of stuff. Um, just firstly, it's been really great to be part of this exhibition. Really nice to be part of something that's um, real life rather than, you know, uh, an online thing, but an online is obviously great as well. Uh, and it's been really great listening to other people talking about their work. Uh, so it's been it's been really good. Um, just a little bit about myself. Um, I've been involved using print uh, since I was a student um, studying sculpture initially at Camberwell, and then I did an MA also in sculpture at the Royal College. Um, and then a couple of years later, I did a, another MA. I was very lucky; I managed to do that. Um, at, back at Camberwell in printmaking um, and therefore I was kind of fully able to focus on just using print which was a, a really a really good a good thing. Um, over the last years I've also taught printmaking and um, and I still continue to do that in some capacity. Um, print has always been a really great medium to work with uh, alongside making sculpture uh, and it was has always been a really good way to um, for me to visualize and work out how things might be made or how things will uh, develop. And so I really enjoyed that making process and it seemed to trans translate well into print um, as they're both kind of fairly process led or well, they can be in some ways. Um, now, nowadays, I don't make any sculpture at all, which is a bit of a shame, but it's just how it is. Um, and so most of my work is, is 2D. Um, and, uh, but I still see the things in my prints, I like the kind of gallery of things you saw at the very end, as uh, being three, almost like three-dimensional forms. And, um, and so that's how I kind of keep my connection with it, I suppose. Um, as you saw in the film, I, I like to collect uh, object or collect, photographically collect uh, shapes that I find. They tend to be things that I find lying on the street. And I've always kind of done this. Um, even many years ago, I started collecting um, the kind of vacuum formed shapes that went over anything from uh, toothbrushes to toys to all sorts, basically anything that comes into your house or that had a plastic packaging on I collected it so I had kind of huge bin bags of them I also collected things like toothbrushes so, so I've always been a kind of a collector um, and I really liked with the plastic shapes how they kind of uh, once the objects and everything were gone how they um, kind of suggested what used to be there um, so that was a kind of uh, my background in a way to collecting things then about about five years ago, I started to be more aware of my kind of immediate environment. I think I was doing a lot more walking and kind of traveling to the studio. And I kind of um, felt myself as being uh, not, not as an activist necessarily, but a quiet observer of my own world. Um, and walking around a city, I, I was also... Uh, very intrigued and shocked about the amount of plastic that was lying on the street. Obviously, if you live out in the countryside, you don't necessarily um, have the effect of that. But um, maybe in every city that is, a, is an issue. Anyway, so I just started to photograph these objects. And then I just, I started, I think maybe it was about that time I started using Instagram. And so I started using that as a place to store these things I don't, wasn't necessarily thinking about the uh, the sharing necessarily uh, but it became a really great place to log uh, all these shapes and also I could access them wherever I needed them if I need them for a reference or, or whatever. Um, today uh, I still use my I, I don't know if, if, if it's something you can look up I have two Instagrams one for my actual work and one for my objects that I found and they're the ones at the beginning of the film um, and I still use that as my kind of go-to reference place um, to, if, if I need uh, some ideas of, of um, you know, where to go with my work. I tend to do it as an ongoing thing. I don't tend to look back into the past. So it's an ongoing thing. And, um, 
yeah, you, you just never, never really know what you, what you might find. <clears throat> and I think, <coughs> oh, sorry, I think I might, um, it, it kind of has given me a, a kind of heightened awareness to, to my surroundings, which is, uh, which is, has been quite nice, I think. So I'm always looking, observing, uh, taking in whatever is around me, um, which has been interesting listening to some of the other talks because there are a few other artists who have similar kind of um, concerns that, and, or kind of things that they um, kind of notice. Um, alongside the objects that I find, I'm also really interested in or fascinated by grids of all kinds and they've also become uh, an important element of my work. Um, they, they also are part of the makeup of the street and um, so it's, it's all within the same uh, area I suppose uh, and they are often, often you know represented in things that, such as grids and grills and coverings generally placed there to, to keep keep people out or to keep things out. Um, and it was also about, uh, about five years ago, I started making stop motion animations. The one you, ones you saw in the presentation, they were some that I made during lockdown. So they were kind of very short, snappy ones. Um, but initially I, I started making uh, stop motions, playing with the idea of grids, opening, closing, um, to give a kind of taste of something just in reach, opportunities coming and going, um, giving you a glimpse of something that was uh, unobtainable. Um, and once I'd started playing with that in the stop motions, it kind of started to cross over into my prints. So it was kind of one thing feeding another, um, you know, different media and forming another, um, which, which I really liked, the kind of two things. Um, and also the great thing about making stop motions or anything, a, a film that you can project, you can project it onto a wall and it can be um, as big as you like. Um, I always found the thing of printmaking of small little prints, uh, no disregard to anybody who makes school prints, I kind of I found that a bit annoying and I wanted to make big things, um, as big as I could anyway. Uh, so the projecting did that for me in a way. Um, of the shapes that I use, maybe more so in the animations, I, I really like things to have humour. I like things to be kind of funny and have a, a bit of a, a story or a kind of oddness or quirkiness to them. Um, and I, I kind of see things as uh, start to develop their own identities or characters uh, through... Uh, through the kind of working, working things out and creating different shapes and, and so on. I make a lot of stencils. I spend a lot of time with a, a, a scalpel and um, carefully cutting out a very stencil. Show you one. There's something I've just cut out recently. I'm going to take it to the studio and print it hopefully tomorrow. Um, so I spend a lot of time cutting out uh, stencils. Uh, they are also based on, on grids that I see, but I also kind of uh, start making them up and um, edit, you know, changing them and, and seeing what I can do with them. Um, I tend to make the stencils that I use out of um, bits of old packaging. And that's also something, that's the thing that I tend to collect these days. Obviously I collect the plastic objects, um, but I also collect packaging. So basically, anything that enters our house as a, you know, packaging for cornflakes or whatever, uh, they end up in my studio. So I've got kind of piles of uh, cardboard uh, and I just really like using something that has had a, I like to point a phrase, a, a kind of a former life and it's, it's got a kind of something else that is happening and all the kind of lines and marks in it. I enjoy working with that um, and seeing how I can, um, seeing what, what I can do with it to, uh, to kind of create my new shape. So they obviously interact with the, the kind of two things coming together. Um, the printing blocks or plates that I use, obviously they're, they're made out of the cardboard and they also become the shapes that I uh, use in my stop motion. So they have two, two kind of existences. And then sometimes I edit them and change them and they come back into a print. So they kind of keep on going. 
um, until they until there's nothing left of them really. Um, so I spend a lot of time. I can just show you. I've just been cutting out today uh, these kind of shapes uh, that I'm going to take to the studio. This is kind of a bit of old cardboard. Um, so it's a e never-ending um, supply of materials, which is which is great. Um, the prints that I have in the exhibition. Um, are part of a series of work titled Shelf Series 2. Uh, there was a Shelf Series 1, um, and this series is made up of 20 prints that all kind of document and archive the objects that I find. I started to use the, uh, the shelf idea as a way of organising and being able to place the objects uh, in a kind of ordered setting. Um, and I wanted to archive things and bring them together uh, so that they could um, kind of exist together and um, the kind of shelf idea was a good way of kind of holding things. Um, and as I've progressed with using this, the, the shelf has become kind of stripes and layers. Uh, and as I've used these things, the kind of boundaries have broken down between uh, how they work um, and then new things start to evolve. So things start, start dropping down and moving around. Um, and I'm happy with that. I kind of go with the flow and see, see what happens. Um, as you might get from the film, I kind of work with prints ongoing and I make decisions as I go along. So thinking through making, um, obviously not all the time, it, it depends. Uh, sometimes I might have a particular starting point that I'll follow through. Uh, but often the, the process initiates the thinking. Um, it becomes a bit of a personal challenge to complete the prints that I set out. So I kind of, I go and buy my, you know, 20 sheets of paper. Uh, and then I, I kind of like to work towards making that set of prints. Um, so it's kind of like a, a, a way of controlling things um, to get to the end, an end point. Um, I want to talk briefly about colour. Um, colour is obviously super important and, and I really enjoy the process of layering, mixing and editing the colours as I go along. And often whilst working, I'll start the day with a set of colours uh, that I will kind of mix and change throughout the day. So keep adding and um, so it's kind of from morning to evening, the colours will have gone through um, so many kind of variations. and. I really like throwing kind of uh, unlikely colours together. Um, and as I think I said in the film, I, I'm not, I don't necessarily think of myself as a colour person because I, I don't know, but I do feel um, I kind of make, just try to make decisions uh, based on my kind of gut feeling of how things work. Um, and if I can't make a decision on something, I just move on. So. Um, the prints, uh, you might have seen that in the film as well, they go through the press multiple times, sometimes up to 20 or 30 times, and, and I keep editing and adding small pieces, and I might put them away for a while and bring them out and add another part, um, all within this kind of 20 prints all working together. So um, I kind of, uh, kind of, when I get to the end point, I can feel like it's done um, and it's kind of finished. Um, I enjoy working with working in large scale. I'd like to work larger, but um, somehow the the press fits fits what I'm doing. So that that kind of makes that decision for me for the moment. Um, but uh, and I, I like the immediacy of working in the way that I do, and um, and I think that's why I kind of jump from print to print, so I can keep my keep my ideas fresh in terms of what I'm doing. Um, in terms of working this way, there are a fair amount of challenges with it. Uh, most of them are kind of technical in terms of things that you have to look out for, but you become very kind of tuned into what they are uh, to avoid kind of messing things up. So I can, can tend to be kind of, I don't know, uh, my workspace can be kind of big and sprawling and I am going to take up lots of space and uh, to try and kind of organise myself. Um, obviously, the lockdown period was a, a challenging time, but I had a plan uh, that enabled me to keep going, um, and that was making this sh uh, short stop motion anim animations. And I, at some point, I was making kind of one a day, 
um, and I'm posting them on Instagram. Um, and it kind of kept me sane through a kind of weird time, which was really good. And I, I think I got quite carried away with it. Um, going forward, I plan to just keep going um, as, as long as, you know, with, with each series or whatever I plan to do um, and just see what comes along that makes me turn a corner and face a new direction. Um, and I'm fine with that, um, just to kind of keep the momentum. Um, and that is probably about all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. That's brilliant. Thank you. I know that um, I've, I've heard several visitors coming into the exhibition and looking at your work and trying to work out what the objects are. What are, <laughs> what are they looking at? Which, is, which has been intriguing. But this, the scale of the prints really has a strong impact in the exhibition. Yeah. But thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so from London, we go to Northumbria. Um, <laughs> Lucy, Lucy May Schofield is Hello. our third and final artist this evening. Uh, and I will hand over to Lucy. In fact, I've, I've just noticed in, in, the, in the comments, I said earlier that it's great to have people from all over the UK joining us. We've had a hello from Joe. Cheers from Portland, Oregon, USA. How fantastic is that? <laughs> Over to you, Lucy. Oh, and Jane is, is there from Berkeley, California. Hi, <laughs> Jane. That's nice to see you. Fantastic. Okay. I'll share my screen um, and just do let me know if you can't hear me or um, something goes awry. You must interject. So... Um, I'm just going to put myself, I'm going to minimise myself there so that you should just hear me talking. Is that right, Martin? We can hear, we can hear you, yeah. Can you see me or not? The, the screen at the moment is focused on your video. So if Great. You... <laughs> okay. Right. Brilliant. So um, this should play. So um, welcome everybody to Northumberland. I live um, in a very rural um, some might say remote part of the Northumbria National Park. I'm around 25 miles south of the Scottish border and um, a, about an hour north of Newcastle. So this is the view out of my um, sort of um, around about February time. So it, it's mostly hill farming community, a very small population of um, shepherds and um, lots of cattle um, and heather and fells, but incredibly beautiful large skies, which have kept me captivated here since 2016, um, when I came here for a one year residency with visual arts in rural communities. They award one year residences to artists to um, have that time to explore the impact of the environment and, and this kind of community on their practice. I became absolutely captivated by the light here and the remoteness. And um, I'd arrived here from a series of residences in Iceland. This one um, is in Iceland, in California at the Kalar Art Institute um, and also at Hospital Field in Scotland. So I was becoming increasingly interested in light and time. Um, so during my time in Iceland, I spent two months there in the winter of 2015. And that was when I began to make cyanotypes or sun prints from the very, very short days they have there, around about two hours of daylight in any given day during the winter time. Um, it was around this time that I started to um, bring back some of the skills that I'd been learning and um, pursuing in Japan, where I was living for two years previous, previous to um, coming back to the UK in 2015. So I'd, I'd learned a little bit. I mean, I'd barely scratched the surface of paper making. Um, and when I arrived in Northumberland, I was really interested in bringing some of those skills here. So I began by making... Um, 160 sheets of uh, Japanese mulberry paper, uh, kozo washi, on a tiny suketa bamboo frame. Um, I then became very interested in the views that you find here in Northumberland. I think I felt very overwhelmed at the amount of space 
Um, and so I started to think about how to access that space or that sky. So I started to make um, sort of print installations or print performances, as I was calling them, with um, cyanotype uh, printmaking, capturing the light of the shortest day of the year, the winter solstice, um, all the way up to the summer solstice. So everything from nine hours of light per day to 19 hours of light. This shooting hut on the Northumberland Moors um, became my muse for the year. This is an installation during the summer solstice where I coated the gable end in cyanotype prints and saw them weather beaten over those 19 hours. Um, because the paper is made of, of mulberry fibres, it's incredibly strong and resilient. So even the Northumberland summertime hail, wind and rain couldn't, couldn't stop um, that paper from printing. Um, throughout the seasons here, I, I've tried to mark my time through performances. So in the springtime of 2016, I spent 12 hours making a, a print um, on the Northumberland Moors with my body in sleep. So from sunrise to sunset, I slept on the moors and um, the silk sheet that I was laid on was a, again cyanotype coated and it became a map of that period, that time, um, sweat and tears and, uh, you know, dew. Um, it was, yeah, a really a wonderful experience to spend time not just part of the landscape but really embedded within it. Um, my final work during this time was um, the building of a one-woman observatory, as I called it, um, named Week From Dreaming, which um, was built in the empty funnel of the um, shooting hut. So this shooting hut had, had had a hole in its roof for many years that was weather beaten. So I created a wooden observatory almost as a window to the sky. So it felt like I was constantly trying to make windows to access the elements. Um, that again was coated in cyanotype chemical and I took a print of that day. Um, and on the autumn equinox, I spent 12 hours knitting um, a cocoon with indigo dyed wool from my local um, spinner who had gathered blue face Lester yarn and dip dyed it in her indigo vat in her garden. And so this was knitted over one year um, on the residency and completed on the autumn equinox within that observatory. And two years later on another autumn equinox, I unraveled that piece on a two mile walk, which took four hours to un unravel one year's worth of time in knitting. And um, so I found, I found this time here incredibly rich and I've carried on making work um, based on the seasons. So um, you can just see here, I'm, I've made um, sheets of mulberry paper again and, and made an imprint on the window of an outbuilding. And um, again, 12 hours of making paper in order to keep it, um, keep a print of that time and that place and that memory of making. So this is complete with flies and spiders and cobwebs and everything that was alive or dead during that day um, as a kind of marker for spring coming. Other, other things that have kept me um, sort of rooted in, in the making have been um, constantly making paper, trying to make better paper. Um, this was a real failure actually, but I popped it in to show that. This is my window that I wake up to in the dovecot and in, on the shortest day of the year last year, the winter solstice, I wanted to capture the light of that shortest day um, in an arched paper, um, which is again a cyanotype. And this is the first time I started to use printmaking on top of that cyanotype, so using woodblock printing. So this is now taking us into um, the period that I have found incredibly nourishing for, for my work and my self, my soul, which is um, spending time in Japan since, since coming back from there in 2015. I've done three residences, always at the bottom of um, Mount Fuji, um, at a really remarkable training school for Japanese woodblock printing. And um, 
you'll probably recognize, you know, the sort of imagery of the ukiyo-e, the, the images of the floating world and the amount of technique um, needed to achieve this incredible, um, these inc incredible results. This is just me uh, making one line with the hangi toe. Um, unlike a, a Western V gouge, the Japanese hangi toe has, um, is used to make the two cuts rather than one. And it's this idea of creating a living line, which I will try to do for all of time, I think, <laughs> very rarely improving. But um, I find this process, this woodblock printing process, which is water-based or mokuhanga as it's known, I find it incredibly captivating. Um, I've fallen in love with it and it, it's so um, ancient, yet it's really contemporary in its use. The beauty of this process is it is completely environmentally sound. It has zero impact in terms of toxicity on the environment. Um, I'm using this living material in wood and in washi, the paper, and it's water-based inks, uh, rice glue, and these simple elements like a recipe, you can alter for each, each time you print and create different effects. The, the printing effects within this one medium are endless. Um, and I feel like I found this technique um, at this, at, you know, 20 years too late. I haven't got enough time left in life to be able to explore it to its full capacity. But it has kept me um, challenged and interested for the last five years anyway. Um, so this work um, that I've been making, I suppose, this is a block I, I made in lockdown. And it, it was, again, just to practice carving. It's based on Utamaro's um, Prelude to Desire, using um, these beautiful wood blocks from the 1790s and um, placing them all together with the idea of touch and intimacy, especially at a time which is we're all deprived of that very thing that we need as humans. So I'm sort of taking elements of each of those prints and overprinting, making them um, into, into one-off pieces or editions or even artist books. And I've been making artist books since 2002, um, when I graduated from London College of Printing on their print media and book arts degree. Um, it's something I always return to. I, I perhaps go off and do other things, but then I'll always come back to bookmaking and using the book as a way to express um, ideas. This is Mount Fuji in the summer. You can see those lights going up there, up the mountain of walkers. It's the only time you can walk um, up that lovely mountain. And back there last summer, 2019, I grew increasingly um, captivated by this window in, this, in the studio that I was in with eight brilliant artists from all around the world. And this piece that's in the exhibition is based on that window. It's called The Way You Look At Me. And um, it's a series of lines that are uncarved, that inked and additioned. Um, and it's really about the diffusion of light um, and, and the intimacy of that gaze between myself and this window and the opposite facing direction of Mount Fuji, strangely. And the other, the other print at, at the Flourish exhibition is um, part of a series called The Substance and the Shadow, which is a, a series of five prints um, that are circular, made on circular paper. And again, that's an uncarved line. Um, it's just using the wood block and pigment and the pressure of the baron. Um, I learned lots of skills in Japan and um, how to make a byobu um, or a screen and how to make a makimono, which is known as a scroll. Um, and I was so thrilled to be able to learn these techniques from absolute masters, the Soyama Sensei brothers um, that were incredible men who had traveled the world and to gain the best knowledge in their field. And I finally learned 20 years after learning how to make my first book, I learned how to make a scroll. Um, and I have continued to be, to be fascinated with that structure ever since. So that's um, one other uh, piece that's in the Flourish exhibition. It's called 1999 to 2019. And it charts the last 20 years of um, 
the emotional landscape, I suppose, it's, um, of my life. So um, that has been something I've been working on for quite a long time and, and I'm now working on the first 20 years. So it should be a series and perhaps when I'm 60, there'll be another, another one. Um, but I'm loving um, exploring this, this way of making prints join together as a continuous line. Um, prints that don't work be always become other things. So this again is, is known in Japan as um, Karakuri Byobu and it's a trick book or a trick screen. So you can have four different images on this structure, which is just two sided to the naked eye. Um, off cuts of prints, thinking about gradation, I'm constantly trying to get perfect gradations or bokashi with this technique. Off cuts have become um, woven prints during lockdown. It, this has allowed me to play more with um, and reuse everything that's lying around the studio. Um, that's been something that I've really enjoyed. And at the same time, I'm always still working with cyanotype, stitching together silk panels, recording light and putting that back out onto the moorland, almost as an invitation um, back to the sky to see the light that it's projected and, and the traveling that the sun has done. So this, these are some exhibition shots of um, Flourish, which I think Martin's done an exceptional job in curating, especially a very difficult scroll. I'm very happy that he's managed to get that looking so elegant. Um, I've made a couple of scrolls since. This is thousands of the letter M typewritten um, until my typewriter ribbon runs out and it's charting time. Um, I thought it might be interesting for you to see the, the scroll that I'm working on at the moment, which is a commissioned piece. Um, and this just takes you through the technique of inking up with watercolour ink, rice glue, sorry about the camera shake, I'm quite aggressive with the brushes, <laughs> and using the, the um, marubake, the, the rounded brushes to um, put the ink all over the block. Uh, it looks quite um, rushed, but it is controlled, believe it or not. And you're trying to get a beautiful, even coating of ink all the time on that block. I'm only printing half of this block at any, at any time, actually. Um, and you can see the wood grain appearing through there. And I'm using for this piece some mulberry paper that I made um, on my recent trip to Japan at, at Echizen Village, which is a papermaking village um, in the Honshu island of Japan. And it took me three hours to make three sheets of paper that I felt were worthy of the teacher's instruction. And I feel that that's also really important for my practice. I'm using materials that I've created more often than not because I just want the investment of um, all my time in that, in that one thing. So the whole piece becomes, from start to finish, part of my working, part of my body, part of my imagination, part of my hands. Um, so this is me printing with some barrier paper with, with the mulberry. Um, the mulberry paper is absorbing the ink. In many ways, you're not having the ink sit on the surface of the paper as if um, a Japanese, uh, sorry, a Western woodcut might suggest. This is, this is um, more like a dyeing technique. The water-based ink, the watercolor, is dyeing the fibres of that of that washi um, to make the paper and the ink really live together and change over time and evolve. And so you never really know, like cyanotypes, they, these prints shift all the time and they become new things and they have a life, um, which is why I love it. I find that incredibly um, soothing to think that all this time and energy is being placed into something which isn't really that stable. It, it continues to surprise and delight and shock and disappoint, you know, um, like humans. <laughs> so you'll just see this reveal here. Um, and this is just one layer. This would have gone back down on the block two or three more times to really intensify that, that indigo. And I think the next very short 
template is perhaps um, a time lapse. <laughs> so what may take sort of five or ten minutes, you can see a few seconds, it's just the second layer going on. Um, and different barons create different pressures. Um, and that's, that's my print table from above. And um, it says my internet is unstable, so I'm going to stop sharing. I don't know if you heard any of that. I hope you did. We, we did. That is absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm, I'm, kind of, um, I'm kind of speechless in a way at the end of three presentations, which have been so rich and thorough and reflective and, you know, using sources from such diverse places and material. But the one thing I suppose that, that I'm thinking of about all three of you is how, and, and the, you know, the best artists do this, is how, how artists receive, how artists listen to the world. And whether it's, you know, the, the grandeur of an Icelandic or Northumbrian or Japanese kind of sublime landscape, or it's little bits, bits of plastic that you pick up off the ground. There's that process of, of absorbing, listening, receiving. It then gets filtered. And what you share with us is just beautiful art. Um, so thank you very much, all three of you. I'm going to see what's in the chat and see if there are any questions or comments which we might come, you might come back on. Um, Claire Grace, who has asked, Suzanne, have you seen the paintings of Balraj Khanna? K-H-A-N-N-A. -N 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 Unmute yourself, Suzanne. <laughs> no i haven't um so I'll, I, I don't know the artist so you, you do know the artist i so don't know the artist know. balraj khanna b-a-l-r-a-j so i'll um i'll look him up or yeah um what is it that claire um it's, sorry is it claire claire grace thank you beautiful use of color has oh. suzanne seen the paintings of balraj khanna yeah. One no, to look I'll at. Look up. Thank you for that. Thank you, Claire. Um, Jane from yep, Berkeley, California. Such strong and striking images. Lovely to see these, Claire. Great presentation. Claire Grace is in Weymouth, very near Portland, Dorset, rather than Oregon. So it's two for two for Portland. Sue me. Great presentations, all three, Suzanne, Claire and Lucy. Congratulations to you all. Lucy, I've known for 16 years and is, you're, a, you're an adopted sprog, apparently. If only I could be. <laughs> <laughs> Sue me so generous. I know, I know. Darling, you know you are. <laughs> yeah, there she is. <laughs> Beautiful and fascinating work, Lucy. Poetry of space. Soulful and sensitive work. Um, yeah, po poetry is coming through. I think that that's uh, that really chimes with me. The way in which all three of you have kind of made, yeah, work which is poetic and, and responding to to kind of big things and little things that we that we're all familiar with. But there's a poetry there which is wonderful. We're, we're all very you, similar, aren't we, Martin? That it's so lovely to be placed with Suzanne and Claire because it occurred to me, you know, in hearing you talk about your practices, we're all so um, captivated by where we live and, and it's completely nourishing us creatively, whether that's city centre or, you know, the wilds of here or the nightlife of Manchester. I just think that's wonderful that you've placed us all. I don't know if that was by design, or, but let's say it is. <laughs> it wasn't by my design, so I don't know, take credit for it. it very it well design, yeah, it, it, and I think that that's one. That's always one of the interesting things about Flourish is that you know, twelve or thirteen artists are thrown together, selected by independent judges. So I, I don't have a, a hand in, in who's selected, but I love installing the show and setting up those conversations between between artists and and 
you know, sometimes work which is very, very different has a connection. So on the one hand, visually, it may not, that superficially work might be dealing with very different issues pictorially, but actually there's a thread there which, which connects. And I think you're, you're absolutely right. There's a beautiful connection between the three of you this evening. Um, Sarah, all three presentations have been extraordinary to listen to. Thank you for your generosity in sharing so much about your work. Um, yeah. Very full, interesting and informative talks about your practices, focused and relevant to space, place, and how we as humans negotiate through. Excellent. <laughs> any final comments from, from any of you as, as participating artists? Oh, from me, just huge thanks to the um, associated with all the brilliant artists in this show. It's such a joy. I feel like, um, you know, such an incomer as a printmaker. I don't, I'm really on the, on the borders of printmaking. So thanks for having me in the family. I've, yeah. Quick, quick question for you, Lucy, from Joe. What's the name of the centre in Japan? Oh, it's the Mokuhanga Innovation Laboratory or Mi Lab. Yeah, if you, um, if you have a little search of that, it's, it's got the best views of any residency on earth, I think. Yeah. But yeah, thank and, you, and, Martin. And you've had some good views on your residencies, haven't you, all over the place? Yeah, I think that's <laughs> the, the prerequisite of any travelling. You have to be able to... Um, wake up to a mountain or a volcano or the sea <laughs> otherwise you might as well stay at home <laughs> yeah thanks very much everybody and uh West yorkshire print workshop for uh, curating the exhibition which i've really enjoyed i mean it's been i've been a couple of times and uh each time seen something different i just like the diversity of the work and um it's lovely to hear Lucy and Claire talk so passionately about their work. I'll be having another look at your talks, I think. Mm -hmm. so thanks. Yeah, and, and thank you again for me. Um, it's been really great to be part of it as well. Um, you know, like um, Martin said, there are so many similarities, but so many differences, which, which is, makes it so rich. Um, unfortunately, I've not managed to get to see the exhibition, but maybe when it moves to Scarborough, um, maybe I'll manage it then. I'll see you there, Claire. We'll have a yes. drink. <laughs> that would be nice. That would be really nice. <laughs> have a meet up, yeah. Um, yeah. Jane in, in California, amazing, amazing women. Thank you all. <laughs> uh, Kate, amazing insights into everyone's work. Thank you. Brilliant presentations, all three of you. Great to have talks online a plus in this strange situation that we're all in. That's from Angie. Amazing, so inspired. Yeah, I mean, I echo all of those, those comments this evening. Um, it's been, it's always a pleasure to, to put on the Flourish exhibition. It's been a delight for me to host a couple of these artists' talks and to listen to the others. And Fabs, our brilliant arts assistant does an amazing job editing all these talks and they will be on um, Instagram TV and YouTube, I think, for a wider audience to enjoy. Um, thank you, everyone who's, who's visited, who's joined us this evening. Thank you to the artists, obviously. But yeah, thanks for, for everyone's comments via, via the chat. Um, this is the last one in the series of Flourish Talks. I'm sure we will be doing more online stuff in a similar way in the future. It just seems to make so much sense. So thanks everyone for attending. And uh, yeah, have a good rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.